Welcome back to our Honors Chemistry series on the periodic table. Uh, we are going to talk about how the periodic table was discovered or developed and the properties of the major chemical families as well as the major periodic trends. So there were two scientists that are mostly attributed to developing the modern periodic table. The first one was Dmitry Mendeleev. He was attributed to with creating the first ever periodic table that was successful. Other scientists had in the past tried to create one um, with varying degrees of success. And what he did that was unique to everyone else was he sat down and he wrote out all of the chemical and physical properties of all of the elements. And then he started arranging them and he noticed that if he arranged these elements in order of their atomic masses, that there was this pattern of the properties that would repeat itself so that elements that had similar chemical properties would generally fall into the same grouping. Um, he was so sure that he was on to the right conclusion about how to arrange these elements that he left empty spaces in his table because he said there is an element here that has not been discovered yet, but when we do discover it, it's going to have these properties similar to these other elements. And the brilliant thing was is that he made this table back in 1869, and he was proved right some 17 years later when we added scandium and gallium and germanium to the periodic table, and they went exactly where he said they were going to go and had the properties he said they were going to have. And so this is an example of, of what he went and did. He originally had like eight groups, and he arranged them in kind of a table fashion with, you know, periods and elements that were similar would fall in the same period and we know now that some of these elements don't go exactly where he said they would but there are some really good explanations for why that was now obviously the periodic table has been modified since then the first major modification was in 1894 where uh, john william strutt and sir william ramsey discovered argon and argon did not fit with any of the groups that Mendeleev had proposed, so they had to propose a new group on the periodic table, which was the noble gas group. And then they ended up adding on krypton and xenon about four years later. And then radon got added on in 1900 when Ernst Dorn, or Friedrich Ernst Dorn, uh, discovered it. And then it was modified again in the early 1900s when the lanthanide and actinide series were both discovered. The lanthanides are elements 58 to 71 on the periodic table, and the actinides are elements 90 to 103. They actually belong in the sixth and seventh periods, respectively, which means the lanthanides go in period six and the actinides go in period seven, and they would actually be placed between groups three and four in the transition metals. But their properties are so unique to themselves and putting them in with the regular periodic table just offsets the whole pattern of periodicity that had been established with the periodic table that typically they're just placed off down at the bottom of the periodic table away from the main portion. And then uh, finally, the... Uh, Mendeleev's table was working really well, but there were two questions that were not answered with his table, and that was why could most of the elements be arranged by atomic mass, but not all of them? And what was the reason for chemical periodicity? Why did we see this repeating pattern? And it wasn't until 1911 when Henry Moseley discovered uh, that if he, you rearranged the table based on atomic number, which is the number of protons, that suddenly that solved both of those questions, that now everything fit exactly where it was supposed to go, and the pattern of periodicity was absolute. It, it worked every time. And the reason why Mosley came up with this and Mendeleev didn't was simple. They hadn't discovered atomic number yet because they hadn't discovered the existence of the protons yet. <clears throat> 
They didn't have the technology to visualize the atomic number until the early 1900s. But even then, it is Mosley, or not Mosley, it is Mendeleev who is credited with periodic law, which says that the physical and chemical properties of elements are functions of their atomic number, and it occurs in a repeating periodic fashion. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the properties of the major chemical families, and we're focusing on the ones that have names. So first we need to call back what you guys remember about metals, nonmetals, and metalloids on the periodic table. So if you remember, metals are generally electron donors. They like to give away electrons in, when they form compounds, which means they make positive ions or cations. And they have the characteristic properties of metals, which means they're lustrous, so they're shiny, they're malleable and they're ductile, and they're generally good conductors of heat and electricity. Nonmetals, on the other hand, are typically electron acceptors, which means they will accept the electrons when they form compounds. They tend to make negative ions as a result, so they, that's called an anion, A-N-I-O-N. They are also usually very dull and very brittle, so they are not very good conductors of heat or electricity. And then if you look at a typical periodic table, you'll notice that there's a zigzag line that starts right underneath boron and then zigs and zags all the way to astatine in period six. Elements that are sitting on that zigzag line, either to the left or the, to the right, with the exception of aluminum, are what we call the metalloids. All right. Anything to the left of that line is a metal. Anything to the right of that line is a nonmetal. And then the metalloids, if we remember, have properties that are somewhat in between both the metals and the nonmetals. So they are semiconductors. Some of them may look kind of metallic. Some of them don't. You know, they can be either malleable or brittle up to a point. And so it's not very many elements on the periodic table that count as metalloids. Just uh, boron, silicon, germanium, astatine, antimony, and tellurium. If you also recall from your previous classes, the periods are the rows that run left to right on the periodic table, and there's seven of them. The groups are the columns, which is the up and down part, and there are 18 of them. And then the law is that elements in the same group will have similar chemical and physical properties. There are several named groups of the periodic table, starting with group one or group 1A. In some periodic tables, the uh, table is divided into the A elements and the B elements. The A elements are called the representative elements, and that's groups one and two, and then 13 through 18. And then the B group elements are your transition metals, groups three through 12, and then your lanthanide and actinide series. So the alkali metals, are group one or 1A. They are the most reactive metals on the periodic table, including being very explosively reactive with water. They are very reactive because they only have one valence electron and they want to remove that electron and give it over to another element so that they can have a full valence shell, um, which means that when they react, they typically form a plus one cation. And since they are metals, they do have all of the characteristic properties of metals. Group 2 or 2A are called the alkaline earth metals. They're very similar to alkali metals, but just not quite as reactive. They have two valence electrons in their outer shell, which they also want to donate both electrons to somewhere else and will typically have a plus 2 charge as an ion. So they form a plus 2 cation. Groups 3 through 12 are the biggest quote-unquote group on the, on the periodic table, and these are your transition metals. They're also numbered 1 through 8B if you have one of the periodic tables that does A and B elements. Um, they do include the lanthanide and actinide series. And typically, when I say name me a metal, 9 times out of 10, you're going to name me a transition metal, like gold or iron or silver or copper. Um, 
The transition metals are unique in that they have varying numbers of valence electrons, not just because this is multiple groups on the periodic table, but when we talk about electron orbitals, we'll get more into why they can do this. But they can form ions with different charges depending on what it is they're bonding with. So for example, iron can form both a plus two and a plus three cation, depending on what it's reacting with. Um, groups 13 through 16 are typically just called after the element at the top of their table. So the boron group is group 13. They have three valence electrons. Most of them are metals, so they typically form a plus three cation by donating three electrons. Um, boron is a metalloid in that group, and metalloids do not tend to ionize. They more likely covalently bond. Uh, group 14 is the carbon family. So all these guys have four valence electrons, and they can either form a plus or minus four charge if they ionize, depending on whether they are acting like the cation or the anion. Um, and then a lot of the metalloids in that group also like to covalently bond, and the nonmetals like to covalently bond in that group. Group 15 is the nitrogen family. They have five valence electrons. They typically want to gain three electrons to fill their octet. So remember, octet rule means eight, so they want eight valence electrons. So when they ionize, they like to have a minus three charge. Most of the elements in that group are nonmetals, so they will either form an anion or they will covalently bond. The oxygen group is group 16. They have six valence electrons. They will usually pick up two electrons to ionize and form a minus two ion, or they will covalently bond uh, the nonmetals. Group 17 is another named group. These are the halogens. They are the most reactive nonmetal group on the periodic table. It's the only group on the periodic table that has all three states of matter at, at uh, room temperature. So there is a gas in there. There is a liquid and several solids in the halogen group at room temperature. These guys are so reactive because they have seven valence electrons. They are one away from having a full octet, which means they will very easily gain an electron from somewhere else to form a minus one anion to bond. Um, they, they also like to typically react one to one with an alkali metal since the alkali metal has to lose one and they have to gain one. It works out perfectly to form compounds. So like sodium and chlorine will form one to one to form salt. And then the last group on the periodic table is group 18, which is the noble gases. The noble gases are totally inert, which means they do not react. And that is because they have a full valence shell already. They have eight valence electrons. And so they will not give or take uh, electrons to form ions, and they do not like to covalently bond either. It takes a lot of energy to get them to do anything other than just sit there. But they make really nice gas lamps if you've ever seen a neon sign. All right, last thing we're going to talk about in this uh, set of notes is going to be periodic trends. So as we said, there's this periodicity to the properties of the chemical families, and there are also some predictable trends that we can observe on the periodic table based on the where the elements are located. So the first trend is the atomic radius, which is the distance from the nucleus to the outermost uh, stable electron orbital, meaning the outer, outer edge of the valence shell of the atom. In general, as you move to the left across a period, so moving from the right to the left, and moving down a group, you're going to see the atomic radius trend increase. Within the period, the reason behind this is that as you move left to right, you are adding more protons to the nucleus of the atom. So you're increasing its nuclear charge. That means that the atom can now bind its valence shell and all, actually all of its electron shells closer to the nucleus, which causes the overall size of the atom to shrink. As you move down a group, we have the increasing number of electron levels. So remember the period number tells us how many 
energy levels are occupied with electrons. So as you move down the group, the period number increases, the number of occupied electron energy levels increases, which means that the size of the atom is going to increase. And so we can see in this diagram, um, notice this is we this is just main group elements. So typically when we're talking about periodic trends, we kind of ignore the transition elements because sometimes they can do slightly weird things. But as we move going from the noble gases across to the alkali metals, we can see that the, the atomic size is increasing. And then because the nuclear charge is decreasing moving this way, and then as we move down the group, we can see that the atomic size is increasing. The second trend is electronegativity. And this is the tendency of the atom to attract an electron in an attempt to fill its valence shell. This is going to increase moving from the left to the right across a period and then moving from the bottom up a group to the top. This trend does not include noble gases, and that is because noble gases already have a full valence shell, so they do not want to attract more electrons. They're fine the way they are, so they will not have an electronegativity. For the other groups on the periodic table, again, moving left to right, you're increasing that nuclear charge. So the nucleus has a greater ability to pull in another electron to fill that valence shell. As you move down a group, those increased number of occupied energy levels are actually shielding the nucleus from the valence shell, which means it is harder for that nucleus to attract another electron to it. So think about taking a magnet and then wrapping it in several layers of paper and then trying to attract a paper clip to it. You'll, it's the same idea. Um, so the electronegativity is actually going to decrease as you move down the group. And so this is a picture of uh, a periodic table that's listing electronegativity values. Um, they use a thing called a Pauling scale, which usually goes from between zero and four. And so you can see that the low electronegativity value elements are down in the bottom left-hand corner of the periodic table. And as we move up and to the right to fluorine, we are increasing the electronegativity values. And again, most of the noble gases don't have one. Krypton and xenon are kind of special, but in general, we say the noble gases don't have electronegativity. Right, the last periodic trend we're gonna look at is ionization energy, which is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from the valence shell to turn the atom into a cation. It's the same, trend as electronegativity follows the same pattern all right and for similar reasons so as we move left to right across the period that increased nuclear charge is binding that valence shell tighter to the nucleus which makes it harder requires more energy to pull an electron away from the valence shell so the electron so the ionization energy is going to increase moving left to right across a period then as we move down a group, or as we move up the group, we'll go the other direction this time. As we move up the group, you have those, you have less occupied energy levels of electrons, which means that the valence shell is much closer to the nucleus. And again, the nucleus is binding that valence shell better the closer it is. So again, it is harder to pull an electron away from a more tightly bound valence shell. So the ionization energy is going to increase moving up to the group. And this will include the noble gases. So noble gases do, are not excluded from this trend. And so if we look at this table with these uh, ionization energy values, so again, the low ionization energy values are going to be in the lower left-hand corner. Francium is the smallest. It gives up electrons, very that for, it gives up that first electron very easily to create a cation. And then as we move up to over towards helium, these ionization energy values are very high because your um, because your noble gases just do not want to give up electrons at all. They're full, they're happy, and they would rather stay as they are. And even over here in the halogens, it takes a lot of energy to remove an electron from a halogen because it would rather gain than lose. 
Now, one thing you might notice in this corner is that hydrogen has a very high electronegativity value and, or sorry, ionization energy value. And that's because hydrogen only has that one electron. It really does not want to give it up. It would rather add one to be like helium and be a noble gas. Um, it will give one up in certain circumstances that we'll talk about uh, later when we get into acids. And so those are all of the major uh, periodic trends. And uh, so now we have talked about how the periodic table was developed. We've reviewed the properties of chemical families, which I'll have probably seen in another class. And we have looked at the three major periodic trends that you will need to know and understand.